Welcome everyone to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorne Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center and I'm delighted to welcome you to our program today. As you may know, this is a weekly program that we started when our building was closed because of Corona. Uh, hopefully our building will reopen shortly, although it is currently still closed. But uh, I plan on continuing to offer these as an online program at least uh, for the next month or so. Um, before I begin, as always, let me encourage you, if you have questions during my presentation, to please uh, click on the Q&A button, which you should find by scrolling along the bottom or the top of your screen and typing in your question. I may get to it while I'm giving my presentation. Otherwise, I will address it at the end of the program. So I'm going to talk today about a copy of the Daily News that we have in our gallery from May 2nd, 1945, that announced in a bold title, the news that Hitler was dead. The newspaper, or this newspaper, was donated to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center by Holocaust survivor Werner Reich, who also works with our school groups, uh, sharing his personal story in an effort to combat anti-Semitism hatred and racism. Werner told me that he was given this issue of the newspaper as a gift from a teacher after he spoke at a high school in Monticello, New York. He said he passed it on to us to put it to use combating Holocaust denial and prejudice. We are grateful for his gift as well as for Werner's other donations and for his tireless energy. The big story in the newspaper, of course, was the news announced on German radio the previous day, on May 1st, 1945, that Hitler had died at his command post in Berlin, and that Admiral Karl Dönitz, previously the commander-in-chief of the German Navy, had taken over as the head of state and the commander-in-chief of German forces. Oops. Before I talk about the newspaper coverage of Hitler's death, I wanted to say a word about the newspaper, the Daily News. The Daily News was founded in 1919, entering one of the most competitive marketplaces for a newspaper in anywhere in the country. Including the Daily News, there were 10 morning newspapers published in New York City in 1920. And the field included some of the largest papers in the country, including the New York World, owned by Joseph Pulitzer, William Randolph First New York American, the New York Times from Adolph Ox, as well as the Herald, the Sun, and the Tribune. But the founder of the Daily News, Joseph Metal Patterson, had both the financial backing of his family's paper in Chicago, the Chicago Tribune, and an innovative plan about how to produce a newspaper in New York that was different from every other, other competitor. The Daily, the Daily News, from its founding, was issued as a tabloid compared to the larger broadsheets of his competitors. The tabloid meant it was printed on a smaller sheet of paper. Here you can see a relative comparison of the covers from the New York Times and the Daily News on May 2nd, 1945. And you can see just physically how much smaller the Daily News paper was. Each page was about five inches narrower with five columns instead of eight and six inches shorter than the broadsheet of its competitors. This smaller paper meant that it was cheaper to produce. It cut the costs of printing the paper. And Patterson also believed it would attract readers because the smaller paper was easier to read on the New York City subway. Patterson also had one other idea about how his paper could differentiate itself from its rivals, and that was photographs. You can see on the masthead of our copy of the Daily News from May 2nd, 1945, the slogan that the Daily News had adopted, New York's picture newspaper. It put that on its head, on its masthead in 1920 and continued to leave it there until 1991. And you can also see on the masthead the image of a camera that it used in the middle of its name. So it put the fact that it was a picture newspaper with photographs front and center on the top of the paper. And from the beginning and lasting through World War II, the Daily News included far more photography on its pages than any of the rival newspapers in New York. You can see that approach in the May 2nd, 1945 issue that we have in our gallery. 
Um, while the paper certainly included articles, um, the major stories dedicated significant space not only to text, but to images. And in addition, the center of our newspaper includes a two-page photo spread. In this case, the photo spread is about Hitler, providing, as it says, a picture story of the life of the man who plunged his people and the world into history's biggest and most costly war. The choice of photos is, I think, interesting. Remember, this is May of 1945. Hitler had been in the center of world news for more than a decade. And he'd been at the forefront of America propaganda's war, uh, America's war of propaganda since the US entry into World War II after Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. One measure of how much Americans had seen of Hitler is the fact that he had been on the cover of Time magazine five times by the time our daily news issue hit the stands in 1945. Uh, the first time was in 1931. He was also chosen by Times Magazine as the Man of the Year for 1938. And I should add that he would be on the cover one last time, just about a week after our issue of the Daily News emerged with this cover. The photographs chosen by the Daily News for the major story in our issue about Hitler include three about his life before the Nazis gained power, one showing him as a soldier during World War I, uh, another showing the Beer Hall push in 1923 in Munich, and one showing him in prison after that failed coup. There are also a series of photographs of Hitler on the world stage, meeting with President Hindenburg when Hitler was named Chancellor in 1933, um, Hitler at the 1938 Munich Peace Conference, which opened the way to the German annexation of the Sudetenland, or meeting with the chief of the French state of Vichy France, Philippe Pétain. There's also him talking with the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs Molotov in 1940, after Germany and Russia had carved up Poland, and a 1934 photo of Hitler walking with the Italian leader Benito Mussolini in Venice which interestingly includes the caption that Mussolini had been executed by Italian partisans just a week earlier. There are also a range of other pro photographs in this issue, including one of the Reichstag fire of 1933, a couple of Hitler with his generals, and one of the failed assassination attempt from July 20th, 1944. I'll come back to these photos in a few minutes, but before I talk more about them, let me turn to what our issue of the Daily News says about the title cover story. Despite the massive headline on the cover, the paper included only limited details about Hitler's death, and instead, like with the photo collage, dedicated a large portion of the paper to summarizing Hitler's life. Indeed, on the first main page of news, there was a repeat of the big headline, Hitler dies at post, um, but the only article that explored Hitler's death on that page is a small six paragraph story that was placed at the very bottom. You can see here the big headline on the page, it's page three, but despite the appearance of that headline at the top, the two articles above the fold focus on one, uh, Churchill's hinting that Hitler's death might lead to a quick end to the war, and two, uh, a radio address or a description of a radio address by Admiral Donitz proclaiming that he had taken over command. As things turned out, Churchill's feeling was correct five days after the uh, issue of the Daily News came out. On May 7th, 1945, Admiral Donitz, who the Daily News in our issue labeled as the new Fuhrer, ordered the German army to surrender. A formal document was signed the following day marking May 8th, 1945, 75 years ago this spring, as VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, and the end of hostilities in Europe. I should also add that at, uh, following the war, Admiral Donitz, the man who took command after Hitler's death and who had been a dedicated Nazi ideologue, was indicted as a war criminal in the first Nuremberg trials, along with other leading Nazis like Hermann Goering, 
and was found guilty of committing crimes against peace and war crimes for waging unrestricted submarine warfare. Donitz later claimed to have no knowledge of the Holocaust, despite the fact that more than 12,000 slave laborers worked in the shipyards that he oversaw, and the fact that he was present in Posen in 1943 when Heinrich Himmler gave a speech to leading SS officers about the mass murder of Jews. Donitz was sentenced uh, to 10 years imprisonment, but remained unrepentant. After 10 years, he was released and lived out his life in a village near Hamburg until his death in 1980. He's a reminder of how difficult it was to decide what justice meant at the end of World War II. That's perhaps a topic for another day, but the newspaper's cover um, reminds us about this man uh, who maybe his name is largely forgotten now. Getting back to page three of our newspaper, the shortest article is the one that actually deals with Hitler's death. Here's a larger view of it. Uh, and you can see the headline, the article raises the possibility that the news from Germany may not be accurate. And I added the transcript in case you're not able to make out the text in the article. They write, whether Adolf Hitler actually died yesterday, the world may not know for some time. Perhaps never. He may never, he may have been dead for days or weeks. He may still be living. However, the Hamburg radio announcement could mean that this is the official end of Adolf Hitler as far as what authority remains in Germany. Whether he is living or dead, it could mean that the Nazi hierarchy has decided that the myth of Hitler dead now suits its purposes better than the myth of Hitler living and leading the last forlorn hope in Germany, uh, sorry, in Berlin. It then ends with the possibility remains that Adolf Hitler actually may have died as described. The main story uh, about Hitler's death finally emerges on page 18 of our newspaper. Uh, the article quotes the German radio announcement, which said, it is announced that our Fuhrer Adolf Hitler this afternoon at his command post in the Reich's chancellery, fighting till his last breath against Bolshevism, fell for Germany. The article also added, the German radio did not say how he died, the inference was left open that he had committed suicide. A one sentence separate story pointed out that the allies would demand to see Hitler's body to confirm his death. And another at the bottom of the page said New Yorkers and GIs were not impressed with the news. New Yorkers who read the news in the evening papers on May 1st, the Daily News reported, looked, some shrugged, no one yelled with joy. One Canadian sailor watching the ticker in Times Square reportedly said, it's great news if it's true. Another woman asked, have you got proof? And said, I have my doubts. Meanwhile, American soldiers in Germany reacted not with joy, but with deep satisfaction, according to the news. The Daily News reported that the chief reaction was, we will fight as long as the German soldiers shoot at us. It also quoted a CBS correspondent to Germany who said, there's a feeling here that justice has been done and certainly a determination that none of the lesser Nazis shall escape. The doubts about Hitler's death um, that were visible in the copy of our newspaper from May 2nd, 1945, continued on for many decades. One of the reasons for that confusion and uncertainty was the fact that it was the Russians who had discovered Hitler's remains and very quickly after that, the war ended and US-Soviet relations deteriorated into the Cold War. It's only really been in the last 10 or 15 years with the release of material in Russian archives that information confirming the details of Hitler's death has come forward. And it appears that the report from our issue of the Daily News was accurate. As the Red Army approached Berlin in 1945, Hitler retreated into a bunker under the Reich's Chancellery, the office of the Chancellor in central Berlin. On April 30th, the news that the German forces in Berlin were being defeated, defeated led Hitler and Eva Braun, 
to retreat to Hitler's personal study in the bunker. Uh, Hitler, uh, sorry, Eva Braun then committed suicide using cyanide. Hitler appeared also to have taken cyanide, but then shot himself. Based on prior written instructions, both of their bodies were taken above ground, where they were burned and then buried. German radio announced the news the following day. And then on May 2nd, the Soviets captured the Reich's chancellery. Two days later, Hitler's remains were discovered and exhumed. And on May 11th, a Soviet autopsy used dental records to confirm Hitler's identity with the dead body. Details of that Soviet autopsy were not released to the US until 1968. And a UCLA study used them for a 1972 report that again confirmed the remains were those of Adolf Hitler. Regardless, in order to spread dissent and confusion in the West, the Soviets continued to claim that Hitler had survived the war. Other studies have followed, the most recent just in May of 2018, when a French group of French scientists confirmed that Hitler died in May of 1945 by taking cyanide and shooting himself in the head. So that gives you a sense about what's in our paper. But just as interesting as what's in the paper, I think, is what's left out. Notably absent from any of the images in the central photo spread are any references to ghettos, concentration camps, or the mass murder of Jews. You might think, well, uh, we didn't know about the Holocaust yet in May of 1945. And it's true that we uncovered much more about Nazi actions and atrocities after the war ended. However, news about the Nazi plan to annihilate the Jews of Europe had been in American press since December of 1942. Journalist Varian Fry published one of the first stories on the topics in Dece on December 21st, 1942, in an issue of the New Republic under the headline, The Massacre of the Jews. The article outlined the exact methods the Nazis were using to torture and murder Jews. There is starvation, he wrote. Jews all over Europe are kept on rations, often only one third or one fourth of what is allowed to non-Jews. There is deportation. Jews by the hundreds of thousands have been packed into cattle cars without food, water, or sanitary conveniences of any sort and shipped the whole breadth of Europe. There are the extermination centers where Jews are destroyed by poison gas or electricity. That's December 21st, 1942. Even more details about Nazi actions had become known in early 1945 as the Red Army liberated camps like Madanek and Auschwitz. And less than a month before our newspaper was published, on April 12th, 1945, General Eisenhower visited one of the most recently liberated subcamps of Buchenwald, bringing journalists and other generals to see the evidence of Nazi inhumanity. So Americans and daily news journalists were well aware of Hitler's effort to wipe out the Jewish population of Europe, but chose not to talk about that in this issue. Even in the two-page article that was entitled Hitler's Life, Crimes, and Fall, there's no mention of concentration camps, gas chambers, mass murder, let alone words like Holocaust or genocide. Now, it's true that generally those two words, Holocaust and genocide, were not yet in the American lexicon in May of 1945, although we now know both terms were in use at the time. About five years ago, the letters of an American military doctor who was at the liberation of Dachau, Dr. David Wilsey, were discovered that show him using the term Holocaust in March of 1945 when he wrote to his wife. His letters are one of the first known document, documents that use that term to describe Nazi actions during World War II, although it didn't become commonly accepted as a word in the uh, mainstream vocabulary until the 1960s, and really not until the 1978 TV film, Holocaust. As for the word genocide, we credit Polish lawyer Raphael Lemkin for coining that term in his 1944 book, Axis rule in occupied Europe. He was also the one who became the prime mover behind the 1948 UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Cri the Crime of Genocide. He wrote in his book, 
By genocide, we mean the destruction of a nation or an ethnic group. This new word coined by the author to denote an old practice in its modern development is made from the ancient Greek word genos, for race or tribe, and the Latin side, for killing. So it's true, it would be surprising to see genocide, the word genocide, or the word holocaust in the 1945 copy of the Daily News, but not beyond belief. But to have no mention of concentration camps, gas chambers, or the mass murder of Jews in an issue that has multiple pages dedicated to describing Hitler, that's just troubling. What explains this omission? Perhaps it was the fact that Joseph Metal Patterson, the paper's owner and editor, had broken with FDR when America went to war with Germany and held strongly to his pre-war isolationist position. Perhaps he did not want to publicize strong evidence of why the war had been the correct decision, even in 1945. More likely, it was that while information about Nazi actions was known, it re remained, even in May of 1945, beyond belief. While what the Nazis had done was something most Americans continued to struggle to comprehend. Another factor may have been Patterson's desire for his paper to be of interest to a broad cross-section of New Yorkers and to serve as entertainment rather than news in many ways. The Daily News in particular sought to shift newspapers to serve as an entertainment source. The photographs and the shorter articles were all part of that plan. Perhaps dealing with the horror and emotionally powerful scenes from death camps would have undercut the enjoyment of reading of his paper and hurt his circulation, at least in his view. He left it to the broadsheets, his competitors, to provide the hard news. But unfortunately, as we know in hindsight, they also largely avoided the details of the Holocaust. Laurel Leff, a historian at, the, at Northeastern University, wrote a book in 2005 that was entitled um, Buried by the Times, which was about the New York Times coverage of the Holocaust. As she wrote, in 1944, you would have learned from the front page of the existence of horrible places such as Madonic and Auschwitz but only inside the paper could you find that the victims were Jews. In 1945, she's talking about liberated Dachau and Buchenwald were on the front page, but the Jews were buried inside. Our goal by placing this issue of the daily news into our gallery is to make clear what Americans saw and did not see in the news of 1945. I will stop there. Thank you for watching. And of course, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and I'll try to answer them. Let me take a moment to remind you of some of our upcoming programs. This Friday at 5 p.m., and I think I may have said the wrong date in a previous uh, program, but please join us this Friday at 5 p.m. Uh, when we and the Human Rights Education Center in White Plains join together for a virtual 2G presentation by Ellen Kaidanov. Next Wednesday, July 22nd at 11, I will be back to discuss a large Israeli flag that we have in our museum that was created in one of the DP camps in Europe and given as a gift to Holocaust survivor Mordechai Carmeli when he left the DP camp in 1947 before even Israel was a state. And next Thursday, July 23rd at 2 p.m., a new time this time, 2 p.m. on next Thursday, the Director of Education, Helen Turner, and I will be giving a joint virtual tour of our museum with a new effort to try and engage everybody in a discussion about what we're displaying. So I hope you will join me at those programs. Uh, you can find a full list of all our activities on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the Events tab. I also hope you will click the Give Now button on our website and help support programs like this one. Okay, let me see what the questions are and if I can answer them. Um, to what degree did widespread American anti-Semitism figure into Patterson's decision? You know, it's hard to know. I don't believe that Patterson was known particularly as an anti-Semite. And by the time we get to 1945, there was a lot of support for helping the Jews in Europe. 
the War Refugee Board had been created. There were efforts to save the refugees before this. So I don't think that that's a factor, although I don't know for sure. Uh, do I know what happened to the remains of Goebbels and his wife and his children? Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, do I think the New York Times covered the Holocaust the way they did because of political decisions or because of lack of information or another reason? You know, Laura Left talks about this a lot in her book, and she says it's not because of lack of information. There was a concern among the pub from the publisher, from Adolf Ox and, uh, sorry, his descendants, uh, Iphigene Ox Salzberger, I think it was, um, not to be too Jewish. And so a uh, fear that by talking about the um, attack, uh, the focused attack by the Nazis on Jews, that they would under, the New York Times would undercut its claim of unbiased information, although obviously it wouldn't have. But so they were reluctant as a Jewish owned, a Jewish family that owned the paper, they were reluctant to shed, to have that information. Uh, is the suicide of Hitler now officially confirmed? Yeah, this uh, Hitler, it is confirmed several times over that Hitler did commit suicide in the bunker in the chancellery on May 1st, 1945. Uh, I, I'm not able to comment more on the suicide letter that Hitler left or what information he left. Uh, is there a reason why an admiral rather than one of Hitler's generals assumed leadership after his death? I think Admiral Donitz was a ardent supporter of the Nazi party. Uh, he had also, he was a committed Nazi. He was committed to fighting to the end previously before this. And so Hitler chose him. Um, there's a question about what, what happened to Hitler's remains. Uh, so Hitler's, Hitler, shot himself and took the suicide and then asked for his body to be burned and then buried. Uh, so there were obviously segments of his bone, including his jaw, which was used for the purposes of confirming his identity after the war. Okay, well, thanks very much again for listening to our program and I hope to see you at some of our other activities soon. Be well, thank you.